Our first scripture is from Psalm 130. It's a prayer crying out to God in one of those times that we sometimes all feel when we, things just aren't, we're just not feeling right. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Our second scripture reading is Ezekiel chapter 37. This is a story of God coming to Ezekiel. He has a vision that is called the Valley of the Dry Bones. <clears throat> the hand of the Lord came upon me and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many living, lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is the word of God. God. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones. Them, uh, right, it was, in, it was going in your head, wasn't it? You wanted to sing it, them bones, them bones, them. Them dry bones. I was very active in, in my church growing up and in the youth group. And there were two things about that time that were, I don't know, immobilizing or terrifying for me. Um, one of them was is that, is that uh, absolutely you needed to be a Christian. And anybody who was not a Christian was going to hell. And that the, the, the dividing line between that um, was very, very tight. So that um, all the time you're supposed to be focused on God and what God wants and be doing what God is doing.
And, and, um, and that scripture passage, I misunderstood at the time, in Matthew uh, chapter 7, which is towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where it says, you must be perfect as your Father is heaven is perfect. And so what kicked in for me in family OCD, and I can get into a whole bunch of other stuff, was that I really, really needed to be perfect. I mean, perfect like I was convinced that God was following me around with a, with a clipboard and a checklist, watching not only everything that I did, but everything that I didn't do, and everything that I said, and everything that I didn't say, and everything that I thought, and everything that I didn't thought. And the idea that God was taking into account everything that I thought that was terrifying. The scriptures uh, starts with Psalm, is talking about, Lord, if you counted my iniquities, if you counted sin, who could stand? If God was following you around, and some of us are convinced that God is following us around with the clipboard, watching everything we do and judging everything we do, because this is God's job, um, only because my mom couldn't be everywhere, so God was doing it, um, <laughs> making sure that we were doing everything perfect and everything right. Who could, who could stand up to something like that? And so the, the psalm starts with this kind of hopelessness, but also, how did this valley of dry bones become dry and dead in the first place? And there is a sense of hopelessness there. And one of the things that crept into my spiritual life was the sense of hopelessness. I will never measure up. I will never measure up. That the fear of doing things wrong was basically killing my joy and creating in me a lifelessness that was noticeable to the point where my parents began to wonder um, whether I was doing drugs or I was suffering from depression or what's going on because my personality was just not the way that it had been at one time. Like, who could count? When we, um, when we talk about the, the, the history of the church and talking about the nature of sin and, and whether, what is sin, um, where does it fit, what happens in the spiritual life, um, it, there's, there's this harsh judgment rather than a recognition of the reality and a hopefulness that comes from God. So start with the recognition of the reality. Um, and this comes from a, from a number of different directions. That uh, what is sin? Sin, the Greek word is hamartia. Um, and basically it's the same word that is used that if an archer misses the mark, it's missing the mark. It is not measuring up. The God has the standard and we cannot live up, or we do not live up to what that standard is. But the reality of it is that the nature of sin is that it, it is really disconnection from God. It's the thoughts and the attitudes and the things that we say and that we don't say that are not aligned with God's will. And when it's not aligned with God, if it's not following God, then it breaks that connection that we have with God. And when you talk about um, the circumstance for humanity, it depends upon who you ask. So for the Catholics, the nature of sin or the original sin is that, um, well, for all of the religions, it's like is you, have, um, you have a good creation and then you have the fall into sin. So we know the story of Adam and Eve and the falling into sin. And that there needs to be a redemption that is going to enable you to enter into heaven and enter into the kingdom of God. So there's a dividing point. How do you get from this fall, this sinfulness life, the lack of righteousness, no sanctification, over into the camp where you're in God's camp? You're going to heaven. You have um, that, that sanctified life. And what's the dividing point? Um, for the Catholics, it was basically we were made good. God did good work. And, but with the fall, it is corrupted. And it didn't mean that all the goodness went away. It meant that there's still a little goodness in humanity, but it's kind of overclouded. It's eclipsed by um, our capacity for evil. If you go to uh, Reformed theology, so now we're talking about like John Calvin and others, uh, the theology that you largely find in Lutheran church or Presbyterian churches and Reformed theology, um, it's how do you get from, well, for the Catholics, how do you get from here to here is you become baptized and you become a part of the church and you're fulfilling your life within the life of the church. When it comes to the Reformed theology, God's the one who decides who gets from here to here. It's already been decided. It's predestined. So humans are completely depraved. 
There is no goodness left. There is nothing about us. Um, everything has to come from God's grace. And God's the one who chooses, who gets over here, and who doesn't, and whoever goes down there. That's already predestined, predetermined. Um, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, but the only people that Jesus Christ died for their sins are the people that get to be picked over here. He didn't die for everybody. So that's Reformed, Calvinistic um, uh, theology. Wesleyan Arminium uh, theology believes that, yes, we were created good. Yes, there is depravity. But that on this side of this wall over here, there's something called prevenient grace. That God's grace doesn't just start when you get over here. But God enables us by God's grace to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ, to, um, to move over into the sanctified category so that there's, um, there's a free will there. There's a point where you make some kind of a decision and move over um, into this camp. So there is the depravity, but it really is by God's grace that we are able to accept. And God knows in advance who is going to um, live a life and get to the point where they will become a follower of Jesus Christ, where they will move into that sanctified, redeemed category. Um, and in Wesleyan Arminianism, um, Jesus Christ died for everybody's sins. Um, but it needs to be put into effect by a person's decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So that's just a quick overview of some of the theological differences between those things that... Um, which one is right? Um, oh, God knows. <laughs> God is the only one who really knows. You know, we know that at some point it is requiring God's grace. There's no way that we can measure up that if, if, Lord, if Lord counts it all against us, there's just no way that we can hold our head up and say, we're in, we're, we got this, we're good, we're golden. Um, it is by God's grace. So there is God's grace. But there's also some point where we are making decisions about how we are going to live our life, who we are going to follow. Now, are we going to do that God's ways? And that has powerful implications for our lives. But the nature of sin is just so, so difficult itself. I mean, when you're actually counting it up, there's, there's the things that you and I know that we did that are clearly sin. You know, um, th th those are the choices. There are things that we didn't do that are sin. So you have sin of commission, something that you actually did, sins of omission, things that clearly to be obedient to God, to live in God's kingdom, right there, right in front of us, and we chose not to do it. Um, there's a sin of complacency, where we know something bad is really happening, and we don't do anything about it. There's a sin of, of um, and that complacency and that corporate kinds of things, like, like how many of our clothes have been uh, made by basically slave labor, and we continue to buy the products and support an industry that is, paying, um, that is not paying living wages, that is things that are made in sweatshops. Um, there are sins of, of things being um, mixed together, where, where you might be part of a company or a corporation that is doing things, that is destroying people's lives, that is poisoning the environment, that is causing cancer and those kinds of things. And if you're not blowing the whistle, if you're not stepping up against it, then you are also responsible for whatever is going on. It's kind of like um, in our legal systems, we have accessories, you know, so that somebody who was the driver where there has a, been a burglary or there's been a, a robbery or there's been a murder, um, those people are held responsible too for the crime that somebody else committed. Um, so we have a tendency in sin to focus on just our individual sins, but there is something about it in terms of we're in a network of relationships where we bear some responsibility for things that are going on. We are part of, um, one of the things about sin is that sin is called uh, something called uh, egocentonic, which basically is a fancy way of saying that it is so much a part of us that we don't even recognize what it is. 
And sin can be generational. So it talks about the effect of sin being passed from generation to generations. There are harmful, sinful, toxic patterns and ways of relating, of relating with one another that get passed from generation to generation to generation. And, you, and sometimes it's like we don't even think of it as being sinful or being wrong because this is just the way our family already always did it. Or, and, and a lot of times... Some people, especially in those isolated, very toxic, um, uh, unhealthy relationships or those families are, don't have much connection with other families, so they don't see how other people do things. So when, you, when you're talking about um, violence or abuse within a relationship, it just gets passed down from generation to generation. So there are generational patterns that have to do with sin. Um, when you take all of that into account, all the ways that we sin, we don't even know that we're sinning, or how we are connected to sins that are existing or we're supporting by our complacency, or because we're, um, um, you know, when you hear hate speech but you don't speak up against it, it's like you've said it yourself. When you have um, hateful actions going to a group of people but you don't stand up against it, then you are also guilty of that. So, all of these things put together, who could stand? How do we know? It's hopeless. Like we're 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 doing things. It's um, and yet the psalmist doesn't stop there. The psalmist says, "Who could stand?" But there is forgiveness with you. There is forgiveness with you. And towards the end of the psalm, um, talks about that God's activity to redeem corporately the people of Israel, that the people will be redeemed. That God's, if you put it through the imagery of the kingdom of God, God's kingdom is coming. When we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's coming. There's nothing that's going to stop it from coming. And all of these things, that the injustice and the, um, and the sin and the hatred and all of that that is not of the kingdom of God will not prevail and will not last. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we have this hope that God gives us in a future that God holds that is not um, in our frail, uh, greedy, um, fallen, sinful hands, but it is in God's hands. And in God we place our hope. When you're talking about my own experience with that, where that, where that sin and that fear and everything else immobilized me and put me into hopelessness, and I was talking about how it, how it killed that. Like, if God counted us, it would be like we are dry bones, rotten corpses in a tomb that there is no possibility of life or future or hope left on our own. And God has decided that death does not get the last word, that dead bones can, be, um, can rise again. And this is where we place our hope. When we come together and we mourn a loss, we mourn knowing that God has decided that death is not, does not have the final word. When we're talking about um, our plans and we're talking about our lives, that we have a, an ability to hope in a future because God is the one who has determined that there is a future. And that, yes, we will make mistakes. And yes, we will fall into sin and yes, God will give us opportunities over and over and over again for a new start, for a new beginning. And the, the kind of community that we are called to be as the body of Jesus Christ is that redemptive community that supports one another, that loves one another, that understands that all of us are sinners and in need of God's grace. That this is not a, um, what's that saying? This is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. This is not where we come to show how shiny and good we are. This is where we come together knowing how much farther we need to grow um, to be a more loving people, a more compassionate people, a more Christ-like people, and that only Christ can accomplish this in us. So that when the people in the community that are hurt, that are wounded, can find here a safe place where they're going to be cared for, known by name, and loved. And this is the vision that God has given us for what it means to live in the kingdom of God. This whole series is living from the inside out. It is like within us, the values of the kingdom of God 
that love, that justice, that forgiveness, the grace, that mercy that God has put in us, how do we live that on the outside? What does that look like in our life together? And what it looks like in our life together is struggling through misunderstandings, um, doing the hard work of being in relationships with one another, um, including people that we don't always agree with, um, to do it differently than the world does it, to not have the polarization, but instead to have one spirit and seeking unity with one another, and never looking down our nose to anyone who walks in the door, but instead offering an opportunity to join alongside somebody in that journey to the cross, knowing that we are a sinner like that person is a sinner, that we have no place to judge anyone else. This is what God does. And what's God's judgment? You know, it was all this, who could stand? What is God's judgment? God in Christ took flesh and died on the cross for your sins and for my sins. The death would not have the last say. The corruption would not have the last say. But in the end, the God's grace, God's love, and God's kingdom will win every time, hands down. Amen? Amen. 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 Lord, we thank you and praise you that you have been willing to, um, first of all, to create us. Um, you didn't have to do that, but you did. And then to desire a loving relationship with us. And when we fall short, because we always do, Lord, um, you come to meet us, to pick us up, um, to brush us off, to, if we are willing to ask for forgiveness, to forgive us, and constantly to offer to us a hope, a future, a new life that can come from you, that your ongoing creation continues to expand and create new worlds in our lives and in our relationships. Um, may we, with boldness, um, and ruthlessly look at ourselves, confess our sins to you, root out anything in us that is not of your kingdom, um, and live in your grace, in your mercy, and in your love, uh, so that all the world may know the good news, that you love them. Amen. The part I didn't get until much later, with God following me around with the clipboard, keeping track of everything, was that God was using a big marker and just scratching off everything that had been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I think when I get to heaven, he's going to show me that clipboard. And I'll finally, finally, maybe, from a heavenly perspective, really understand the scope of God's love for me and for us. Go forth and serving God and your neighbor and all that you do in the forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen.